And uh, they were with us last summer, so was this? Yeah, they were this, this past summer. They're, they're back on the field right now. So um, this comes from December. It says, Dear family and friends, it is hard to believe it is the end of another year. This year we had many different emotional moments, moments of sadness like the home going of Don's mom, Linda, but the blessings of knowing she was born again and a believer. The emotional goodbyes with our kids and grandkids, but the blessings and memories we were able to have with them and a new grandson, Darren, was born in September before we returned to New Zealand. The old and new friendships that we are blessed to enjoy, uh, being able to return to New Zealand, New Zealand and see our church family and friends has been a true blessing. Having a ministry partner here in Masterton to co-labor with is a blessing. God has truly been good to us. It's nice having Logan and Brittany Bankston here working with us in the ministry. For the first time, we have a piano player. He says it does not make much difference. It doesn't make him sound any better. Um, we've enjoyed their four children. Um, uh, one of the uh, things they did is they made uh, Christmas cookies. They had some Thanksgiving dinner and uh, a time of Christmas fellowship with the churches there. And says to pray that um, as they've given up many gifts to the community, that hearts would be opened and the gospel be given out. One of the kids that live next to us, James, has moved in with another family member, and I do not see him any much, much anymore. <clears throat> but God has allowed me to build a relationship with this young guy. He is six. When he was visiting his aunt next door, he saw I was back and dropped his bike and ran over to the fence to tell me everything has been going on in his life. Of course, he remembered that I keep ice blocks in the freezer for him. Like, what are ice blocks? Uh, popsicles. So, please pray James will be able to come to church with us and learn of the Savior who gave his life for him. So, thank you for uh, your faithfulness and giving and your time in prayer and financial to the ministry of God has called us to. Uh, we're just getting back on the field there and getting things uh, re uh, reinitialed and um, in the ministry going again. But let's remember the judge this morning in prayer. Heavenly Father, was good. morning turn to the book of Judges chapter 6 if you would the book of Judges chapter 6 I'll read a couple verses to you and we're going to be looking at a good bit of 6 and 7 uh, this morning Read a couple verses, we'll pray, and we'll introduce what I want to say, and then we'll go through uh, these couple of chapters here uh, this morning. Uh, Judges chapter 6, look at verse 11. And the Bible says, There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joaz the Abazernite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the, angel appear, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. I'm going to preach you a message uh, that we've entitled this morning, Looking for a Few Servants. Looking for a Few Servants. Let's pray. Father. I pray this morning you'd open our hearts, you'd open our understanding, this Old Testament story tonight, this morning. Father, you would uh, help us, and, and uh, Lord, the Spirit of God would take it and apply it to our hearts today. Well, thank you. We'll give you praise in Jesus' man, uh, Jesus' name. Amen. You know, folks, today... God is looking for men and women of principle. 
we live in a time of opportunity today to shine for God uh, like no other in my lifetime. I, I, when I thought about it, I thought about maybe the history of the church, but I look back at the history of the church, it's always been marked by difficult times. Actually, in America, we really have it pretty easy if you want to compare church history. But anyway, in my lifetime, what an opportunity to shine for Jesus Christ. But you know, folks, to do that, we need some conviction in our life. We need to carry out conviction in our life. You know, in the church today, it's become unpopular to live by a set of standards. Uh, as soon as you say that word standards, immediately the thing that comes to someone else's mind is, oh, you're, you're a legalist. But I'm reminded in the scripture, the Bible says when the enemies come in like, the, like a flood, that the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. And so let me define a few words today that uh, principle, what is a principle? A principle is a Bible truth by which we live. I read a principle in the Bible, and I want to live my life by that, that principle. Then there's the word conviction. Now, uh, folks, a, a conviction is, is stronger than a preference. There are some things that I prefer, and there may be some things that you prefer, and neither one of them is wrong. I just prefer one over the other, and you may prefer something else over what I prefer, but a conviction is different. A, a conviction is a personal belief based on a Bible principle. Uh, listen, folks, if you and I have a conviction, we ought to be willing to die for a conviction. Now, I'm not going to die for my preference. I like cheeseburgers. You like rigatoni. Well, I think I'm right. But you think you're right. Well, I'm not going to die over a cheeseburger. But now, if I got a Bible conviction, that's different. There's some things in the Bible that we stand on and their convictions, folks, and I'm going to live my, I'm going to, uh, based on the principles of those, the, the Bible, I've got conviction on those principles and by God's grace, don't ever want to change them. And then there's a standard. A standard is a guideline which helps me keep uh, 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 it's, a, it's a guideline that helps me keep our standards. Um, I see a principle in the Bible. I'm, I'm convicted that that principle's right. And I'll set up standards in my life that'll help me keep that principle, that'll help me hold to that conviction. I hope that makes sense to you. Conviction's something we ought to die for. Uh, folks, men and women, uh, through the history of the church, have died to give us our Bible have shed their life's blood that you and I might have the Word of God in our language today. They had a standard, they had a conviction, and they were willing to die for it. I'm not here so much to preach a message this morning to, to tell you that you and I ought to just go out and die today. That's God's business when that happens. But I see today in the, in the time in which we live, we need men and women of conviction today. I mean, we, we just live in a world today where just anything goes. I was telling, I think it was Mick uh, earlier today, we were coming in, we are talking about, I was watching a, a news clip this week, and I, I think, I may be wrong about this, but I think the, the school board was in Arizona. And um, they were talking about recruiting uh, school teachers out of this college in Arizona. And um, uh, this one on the school board 
went on to say that we ought not accept teachers from this college anymore and she said, here's why so she went to this website of the bible of this of this college and it said that we teach our students to obey biblical principles and it said a few other things in there uh, but because of that it said because uh, because of biblical principles we ought not allow graduates from that school to teach in our school system did anybody see that anybody else a couple of you did. And there was a lot, she said a lot more uh, in there too, but, but I thought, my goodness, which principles are you talking about? Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. We can't have people teaching like that in our schools today. We need principles today, folks. We need convictions today. And we need to stand on those convictions. I look at this passage in Judges chapter 6 and chapter 7. The book of Judges is, is a book of cycles. Let's go back and pick up a little bit more reading. Look in chapter 6. Look at verse 1. Uh, Judges is, is a book of cycles over and over again. There's sin, there's servitude, there's supplication, there's salvation. The children of Israel would fall into sin. Well, they didn't fall into sin. They, they marched into sin, knowing they were doing wrong. And because of that, they went into servitude. Well, they'd be in that servitude for a while, and then they would, their supplication, they would cry out to God, and God would bring salvation. So Israel in this passage has fallen into, they've sinned, they've sell, fell into servitude, and they begin to cry out to the Lord. And look in verse 1, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which were in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Uh, the Midianites had come in and, 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 and their servitude uh, that they placed on Israel was so, the, 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 so bad that the children of Israel went out and they hid themselves. I feel like sometimes we're like the children of Israel today. We're hiding inside the, the walls of our church and, and we're afraid to go out sometimes because folks, it's getting pretty bad out there. And it was so, verse 3, when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. They encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. And so uh, it's the time of harvest. Uh, Israel has sown. It's time to weep, reap that harvest. And, 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 and then all of these, the Midianites, the Amalekites, the children from the east, they come in and they destroy the crops. They destroy the, the animals. Just take everything they got. I don't know if you, you know much about farming, and I don't know a lot about farming, but I know a little bit about uh, uh, planting s small amounts of crops. And uh, years ago, uh, when I was in Bible college, and uh, I, was, I planted some corn, and I don't know, it was five or six rows of corn, probably about half the length of this sanctuary here. And I watched that corn grow. Well, I took, I kept it, the weeds out of it. I miracle growed that thing. And I had stalks of corn. I, they were big and, and corn. It was, and I thought, oh, this is going to be good. I got up one morning to go to school. And the raccoons came in and took every ear of corn that I'd grown. Didn't leave me not one. When I read this, I, I, I sort of feel like I must, must be how they felt. Man, my heart just sank. I hated raccoons that morning. <laughs> you know how much work I put into that corn? And I could just taste it. And I didn't get one ear. Not one ear. Raccoons got every bit of it. And so that's sort of a very, very small scale of what Israel was going through at the time. Verse 5, For they came up with their cattle and their tents 
And they came as grasshoppers for a multitude, for both they uh, and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And so this servitude had gotten so bad, but now they're going to get into the supplication part of this cycle. Sin, servitude, supplication, and God will send salvation. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt. I brought you forth out of the house, house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Excuse me. <clears throat> Folks, it's not just, just an Old Testament story. God's given them to us for our learning, for our admonition. We might take these stories. Well, my... oh, listen, folks, God has delivered us from bondage, the bondage of sin. He's given us the principles of his word. We need to build standards in our life that will help us keep the convictions that we have on, on the word of God. But we waver, do we not? We do. And we get into the same situation that the Israelites were in. We fall into sin. And because of that, we fall under the servitude of the devil. And folks, he's a hard taskmaster. And then it beats us down so bad that we get to the point where we, you ever heard this one? We're so far down, they know where to look but up. And we cry out to the Lord. And I'm so glad he's faithful. He sends us deliverance. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which obtained uh, Ophrah, uh, that pertained to Joash the Abazarite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So it describes the condition of the nation. And Gideon is God's choice of a man. We look in verse 11, and uh, the Bible says uh, that his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. You know, I believe Gideon's just doing all that he can. I mean, you look around him, and, and, and the enemies come up. The Bible says like grasshoppers into the land. They're just everywhere. And here's Gideon, and he's out there, and I believe he's behind the, uh, the threshing floor, and he's, he's just trying to do what he can. You ever feel like that? In the day in which we, I'm just trying to do what I can. He probably thinks the situation just overwhelming today. And I feel like that sometimes. Well, I just feel like sometimes the opposition comes from, from every angle. And, and you wonder, is there any relief? That must have been how Gideon felt. And then in verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. I wonder if Gideon thought, who's he talking to? There's nobody here but me, <laughs> and I don't feel like a mighty man of valor. Matter of fact, I'm just back here right now. I'm just trying to do all I can. I'm just hiding from the Midianites. I'm just trying to get my little corner of what I got so I don't starve to death. And God says, I'm with you, you mighty man of valor. But then look at verse 13. Gideon's got a complaint. And Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? 
where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Where's the Lord? You know, I, I've heard that, folks, and you probably have too. Every time some catastrophe happens in our world today, somebody's going to say, well, where's God? If God's such a loving God, why did God let sin, servitude? Listen, folks. <laughs> Where is the Lord? Why is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of saying? Well, I, I, I like I like testimony time when folk get up and they talk about you know what God's doing in our life. I I get I like to do it here on Sunday nights. We usually do that. And, and sometimes I, I get a little bit weary about doing it because every time I ask for it, I know two little girls sitting right here. <laughs> and I don't know what they're going to say when, when they get started. But it's great when we get up and say, oh, God's been so good to us. You know, I hear, I hear testimonies like this. I remember 30 years ago when Jesus saved my soul. And I praise the Lord for that. Amen. Hallelujah. But where is our testimony for today? The Bible says in Lamentations chapter 3, it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, we serve a faithful God today, folks. Oh, listen, when my, we, when my faith is weak, when I stumble and fall, my God remains faithful. He's able to keep me. Praise the Lord. But Gideon's complaining. Lord, if you're with us, why is all this happening to us? You know, and God listens to him. He don't rebuke him. But look at his answer. Gideon says, I'll read it again. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles? which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Here's, here's Gideon, and he's complaining. Look at the Lord's answer. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go. I've heard you complain, Gideon. Now get out from behind this threshing floor and go. Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. His, his might was him that the Lord had looked upon him. Gideon, you're not going in your own strength. We look at the world in which we live in today, and sometimes we just feel like we're just overwhelmed, and, and maybe we say, Lord, <laughs> Job said that. He said, I look, I look ahead, I can't see him. I left to the right, I look up and down, I can't perceive where he works. And we get that way sometimes, I think. I know I do sometimes, and I imagine you do at times as well. And the Lord just says, get up and go. I've given you a job to do. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. For no matter how dark it gets, no matter how much the opposition comes at us, God has promised to go with us. Now go. You got a job to do. 
I think it sounds a lot like the day in which we live. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, the Lord said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Listen, folks, sheep in the midst of wolves usually don't turn out real good. Somebody's going to get eaten. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew uh, chapter 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. But Lord, the job is too big. Lord, I hear all the things you did for Elijah. I hear all, read of all the things you did for Elisha. Oh, Paul and Peter and James and John, we hear about them. Um, John Bunyan, we heard about this morning in Sunday school. Uh, we could go on and on and on and we hear about what great things that they did. Listen first, but we serve the same God. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress in prison. Sometimes we feel like the job is just too big. Listen, I want to say folks to you this morning, for you and me, it is too big. But it's not too big for the God that lives inside of us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, the Bible says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. I'll tell you what, folks, God gave me that verse one day when I was struggling with, God, you, why would you call me to be a preacher? I don't have a lot of education. I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm not eloquent. I'm reading my Bible one day and I read that verse right there. And God said, now what's your problem? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like the job's too big. But look at verse 15 and 16. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. There's his answer. I just come from a small tribe, and I'm the least in all the tribe. And the Lord said, I'll be with you. Don't you worry about it. You just go and do what I've called you to do. Well, folks, there's a preparation that God will take us through. Look in verse 17. And uh, the Bible says in verse 17, And he said unto him, If now I found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry till thou come again. Then look at verse 19, And Gideon went in. And made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot. And he brought it out unto him under an oak and presented it. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Take the flesh, the unleavened cakes, lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand and he touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rocks and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. God's preparing him. Gideon said, Oh, I want to see a sign. And 
Now, folks, we're not a sign-seeking people today, but I want to tell you, listen, if you're saved, you've seen the face of the Lord. He lives inside of you. There's that, there's that affirmation of that call. The call will be evident. It was evident in Gideon's life. And folks, the call's evident in your and my life today. We don't bake cakes and uh, leavens of bread and this and that and the other. And but the Spirit of God lives inside of us. That's our affirmation today that God has given to us. The call was evident on Gideon. The call will be evident on us today. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. And so uh, the church is going to send out missionaries. And here are people that are busy in the church and they're working. And so they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. Folks, that is our job today. Oops. Where's he sending us to? Well, folks, he sent you to Shalom Baptist Church. And from here, he sends us out into the communities where we live. He sends us out to do his work. He calls us, what is the work? Going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's a big job. Now go. What's your excuse? Well, I'm not eloquent. Well, I'm shy. Well, I don't have education. Well this, well that, well the other. And God just sits there and he just lets us go on and on, don't he? And when we get finished, he says, now go. I've told you I'm going to be with you. Folks, if God be with us, who could be against us? So there's that preparation of a man. Listen, folks, you're being prepared right now, right here in the pews in which you sit, as the Word of God is being preached to us. God is preparing us for the work that He calls us to. It's too big. God says, I'll be with you. Now what's your excuse? Well, I guess I don't have one. We're going to say God's not big enough. Anybody want to say that? So there was a call. There was a preparation of a man. But there's also a cleansing of a man. Listen, folks, God's going to cleanse the people that he calls. Chapter 6, look at verse 25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with wood of the grove which thou cut down. And Gideon took ten men of his of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him and it was so because he feared his father's household the men of the city that he could not do it by day that he did it by night sacrifice the cleansing of our lives listen folks we're going to serve the Lord if we're going to go out and do God's will what in our life today don't belong in God's service the high places, the, the altars to Baal. Gideon, before I can deliver this land, they have to come down. What worldly things in our life need to be cleansed out. You know, I thought about giving a, a whole grocery list this morning of worldly things. But you know, I don't think I will. Because the Spirit of God lives in you and I don't need to give you a list. He'll give it to you. What worldly things in your life right now is God speaking to you about? 
that need to go. The altars of Baal, Gideon, they got to go. The groves, the high place where people worship their false gods, they need to go. Gideon's more than willing to do it. But folks, when we get that call and we step into that cleansing process and we're willing to get those worldly things out of our life so that we can serve Jesus in this wicked world, you back and mark it down, there'll be opposition in your life. Look at verse 28. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Boy, now, isn't that something? Gideon just did what God wanted him to do, and now they want to kill me. Well, that's not fair. God's not through yet, folks. That's all. But listen, just try to live for Jesus. Opposition's going to come. Hostility of They're going to try to stand in the way. But notice the purging. Look in chapter 6, look at verse 33. Then all the Midianites... And the Amalekites of the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and blew the trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and unto Neptali. And they came up to meet them. Look in uh, chapter 7. Then Jerubbabel, uh, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained 10,000. So Gideon says, all right, I'll get me an army together. And he gathers 32,000 men to go to battle. That's a pretty good size army. No, but I wish we had 32,000 in here this morning. <laughs> We'd need a bigger room, wouldn't we? They said, it's too many. And Gideon says, all right, if you're fearful, if you're afraid, then go back. And then there's only 10,000 that are left. Look at chapter, verse 4. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. That's sort of like Christians today, aren't they? Isn't it? When you, when, when, when you boil it all down... I mean, you go out and down south especially, if you go out down there and you start witness, everybody's a Christian. Well, no, they're not. You start to boil it down and the number starts to get smaller and smaller. And the Lord said unto the Gideon, the people are too many. Bring them down to the water and I will try them there for thee. Uh, and it shall be that uh, of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that lappeth 
of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth? Him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And a number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink. So they started out with 32,000, and now God's dwindled them down to 300. To 300. Listen, folks, it's not going to be the masses who fight the war. I had a preacher one time, he said that, um, he said just about every church, and, and you know, I've traveled a good bit in different places and been in different churches. He said just about every church that I go to, he said 10% of the people do 90% of the work. God help me be part of the 10%. said, oh me. Ten percent of the people do ninety percent of the work. Thirty-two thousand men, and now we're down to three hundred. It's not going to be the masses who fight the war. It seems like in life, folks, we're always the few. You go to the workplace. You're going to be the few. You may be the only one in the workplace. You go to the schools. I'll tell you what, folks, our schools are a mess today. The things that they are pushing on our children today is ungodly. I'll tell you what, we need some kids in school today that will stand up for Jesus Christ. And when you do, you'll be in the few. Hey, look, at, take your Bible and put it on top of the rest of your books and carry it to school with you. You go to the malls today. I don't, listen, I've quit going, I quit going to the malls a long time ago. Now, I, I have to go sometimes because, but I, when they're open, I walk in the door and I get out just as soon as I can for anybody else can get there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You just walk through those. Trust me, you're in the few in there. Uh, the ball fields. It's getting any more where you can't even be involved in, in those type of things before because you're in the few. You, you heard our politician. I can't even think of her name right now. No, 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 no. This is this back in the other administration. She got on, on the TV and she says, when you go to the gas station, you get in their face and you cause trouble. And yeah, right, right. Oh. Just go to the gas station. <laughs> You'll be in the few. Folks, we're always going to be in the few. But if God be for you, who can be against you? But I'll give you this last thing. And folks, here, here's an important part of the message this morning. All these other things are true, but it's leading up to what I want to say to you. I want you to look at God's perfecting of a man. We're in chapter 7. Look down at verse 16. So we've... All, all of the, everything that I've given to you sort of is sort of uh, introduction to how I want to end the message this morning. So that Israel's fallen into sin. They've fallen under servitude. They've cried out unto the Lord, and now God's ready to send salvation. Look at verse 16. We've gone from 32,000 to 300. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pictures and lamps within the pictures. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with the trumpet, 
and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpet also on every side of all the camp. And say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And so Gideon and the 300 men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and they break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew trumpets and break the pitchers. And they held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Verse 21. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets. And the Lord said, Every man's sword against his fellow even throughout all the host, and the host fled. And so, folks, God brought the victory. And the picture, the, the picture is here. They had an earthen vessel. And they took that vessel and they put a lamp inside of it. And when Gideon said, when I blow the horn, you blow the horn, and then we're going to break those pictures, and that light is going to shine forth from those clay pots. Folks, you and I have a treasure in earthen vessel. That's what we are. We're just an earthen vessel that God formed out of the dust of the earth. When we were saved, He put the Spirit of God inside of us, which is the light of the world. And inside of us contains that light. Well, God wants that light to shine forth. How does that light shine forth? Folks, our vessel has to be broken. And when that vessel is broken, that light that is inside of us can begin to shine forth. You see, folks, God's not interested in anybody seeing me and you. He wants the world to see Him. And the way that he, the world sees him is he'll take our earthen vessel and he'll break them. And when he breaks them, the light is allowed to shine forth. And people look and see a broken vessel, but there's this radiating light that shines forth from that vessel. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, you're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. You see, folks, there's a, there's a, there's a lost and dying world out there that live in darkness. God has put a light inside of you and I. He you say, oh, why do things happen to us the way they do? So our vessels can be broken. That the light that's inside of us can shine forth and a lost world can see Jesus Christ. Folks, that's, that's, that's where we're at. That's where we live. The Bible says in verse 21, every man stood in his place. We need Christians today standing in their place in faithfulness, in confessing sin, in witnessing in living godly lives. See, folks, I don't care what the world says to us. And I don't care what the compromising church says today. God is still looking for people to live holy lives before Him and before a lost world. He's looking for Christians who won't be eat up with bitterness. He's looking for Christians who won't get involved in backbiting and, 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 and complaining and murmuring and no jealousy in our lives. Looking, looking for Christians who won't live the immoral lifestyles that the world wants to put on us today. He's looking for Christians who will say, I'm not going to live my life any longer in anger. And when he breaks our vessels, that light begins to shine forth. In verse 21, the Bible says, And when that light shone forth, God brought the victory. You say, well, that's an amazing story. I want you to notice one more thing. I want you to go to chapter 7, and I want you to look at verse 9. And as I was reading this, and I read it many times, and I never really considered this in this light right here, but I want to give it to you this morning. 
in chapter 7 and verse 9, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host. Talk to Gideon. Get down to the host of the Midianites and the, and, and, and the enemy. For I have delivered it into thine hand. Verse 10. But if thou fear to go down... You ever felt like the Lord was wanting you to do something and you just, I'm just afraid to do it. And I mean, if you've ever tried to live for Jesus, you've been afraid of the will of God at some point in your life. If thou fear to go down, go with Pura, the servant, thy servant, and go to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say. And afterwards shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Pura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Now look at it. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east lay long in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand of the sea for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. And it came into a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay long. And this fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. So I got to think about that. You know, all right, God said go, right? Uh, you take all everything else we said, uh, the opposition that's there, the enemy that's there, it's coming in from all different sides. We feel like, oh, we're overwhelmed and we're saying, God, we, how are we going to? And God, all right, just go. Well, God, you not told me how you're going to. Just go. And so, so here's the child of God. He's getting instruction from God to go. But now you got the enemy out there. And we'll, the enemy, we'll, we'll say the enemy are the lost, okay? are the ones that God wants to save. But you know what? I've got God's instruction to go, but I've not heard what God's told the enemy. There's this, this Midianite, and he's got a dream. Man, I, I, I've seen this cake of barley roll into the tent, and the tent's, hey folks, you and I are the cake of barley. We just need to go and roll out into the tents of the enemy and do the will of God. See, God told them, said, hey, look at, <laughs> and then they've had this dream. And I don't know what God, how God's working in the life of the, you see, there's this, there's this process of, of planting and watering. And I don't know where the process is. I just need to go do what, I don't know what God's done in that person's life to prepare them for the light of the gospel. God's not limited and how he brings victory. Folks, all I know is God said, go. And I'll be with you. Do we really need any more than that? God's working in people right now. God's working in his children right now. Sitting in this room, God is ministering to our hearts. I have no idea what God's doing in the heart of the lost right now. I have no idea what He has done in that soul to prepare them for the gospel. All I know is God said, go. So what are we waiting on? Let's just go do the will of God. I know the day. I know the hour in which we live. If you look up here at this clock right here, it's one minute to midnight. The hour's late. And the need is great. I know what God, my job is. Hey, I'm just going to leave the rest of it to God for the, the others. I don't know how he's preparing them. I'm just going to trust that he has. God looking for a few servants today. Let's be one of the few. Let's be one of Gideon's 300 men, women, children. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I heard you bow and our eyes are closed.